Hey everyone, welcome. So great to have you with me here at lunchtime here on a Tuesday. I'm uh, super pumped to share what we got today. It's gonna be really neat information. And for some of you, it's gonna be brand new information and it shouldn't be, <laughs> so let's make it happen. And we have a little visitor. I've got lights on in here and it's like 80 degrees. So we have all our doors open at the clinic. So there's a, a, a lovely little uh, fly hanging out here with us as well. Okay, my friends. Well, uh, my goodness, we have a bit of ground to cover in this short lunch period time. Uh, I'm going to give it a, maybe a few more minutes here. It looks like we've got people trickling in at a fast rate, actually. So fabulous. Uh, great to see you all, uh, although I can't see you. Normally, I like to meet. You know, I have this class and I teach in this Zoom meeting room, right? And I get to see everybody's faces. And so I'm wishing I could see yours, but I'm going to imagine you now. And Hey, uh, here we go. Uh, we're going to be talking today about fascinating subjects, um, one that's, that's really taking over the field of medicine right now, which is basically toxicants, and how toxicants are uh, inducing a loss of tolerance in people's immune systems, one, one thing, but they're also altering the entire ecosystem. So if you're going to shift an ecosystem, you have to think that you're going to shift a human being, <laughs> right? I mean, think about this for a second, right? Everybody's going to be breathing air. They're going to be drinking water and they're going to be eating food. So if you're going to be saturating that water with specific herbicides, for example, and then you're going to eat a tomato that's 80% water, then you're going to have some exposure, right? So what's that doing? How is that changing the disease process? How is that changing humans? And what you would find if you start digging like I have over the last decade is that there's a tremendous <laughs> amount of things that happen. Um, and not all of them are beneficial. But where people are focusing right now in the blogosphere, in conferences, lectures, summits, and whatnot, is only part of the, the story. There's a lot more, there's a deeper dive into this whole adventure. And I want to start looking at some of those little nuances today. I think it's incredibly important because uh, we're all told certain things like, you know, take your vitamin D at X amount and you'll be fine or take your vitamin K at X amount and you'll be fine. And the reality is if you have underlying issues, that might need be sufficient. That might not pertain to you. So it's really important that we understand the nuances, right? All right, let's dive in. Let's check it out. So we have a... Uh, a webinar that we're going to be looking at today, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. Let's do this from the start. All right. So this is Pearls basically from the Progressive Practitioner Coaching Program. And, um, uh, you know, I've been at this game for a little bit here. I'm Tom Altair, if you don't know who I am. I'm a certified functional medicine practitioner. I've been a nutritionist uh, since 2005. I actually graduated my first degree in 2002. Uh, I've been following the Institute for Functional Medicine and uh, Dr. Jeff LeBan basically in the early 2000s. So basically 2000, 2001, I started diving in full, full bore. And by 2004, I had my own study group on functional medicine. And by 2007, I was instructing across the United States for Thorn Research. So I used to be part of the medical affairs team there. So I've been looking at research for a very long time. I've been talking to practitioners for a very long time. And what I see is, is that many of the practitioners don't have the full story about what's going on. So this is why I made up this particular program called the Progressive Practitioner Coaching Program, where I meet online live for 10 and now because of a bonus week, 11 weeks. And we basically hash it all out. We say, hey, gang, check it out. You think you know what digestion is, but do you really know? You know what, what influences digestion? Are there chemicals in the environment? Are there certain nutrient uh, deficiencies? Are there certain medications? We dive into the whole gamut, and we basically try and reverse disease. <laughs> and I'm not even joking around here with reversal. I mean, I just got back from the annual international conference with IFM, and we're showing you can reverse Alzheimer's and MS and all sorts of different things. It's not easy, mind you. There's, you know, 36-point protocols for Alzheimer's disease, but it's happening. And it's a massive testament, a massive testament to systems biology where you know so many doctors, so many medical journals are trying to look at a single factor and they're trying to say, look, you can take this one drug or you can do this one diet or you can do this one thing and you're gonna reverse a disease. And that's not true. Usually there's thousands of contributors that make people, si people sick and you need to put at least 10 or 20 different contributors back in check before they can get better. So we talk about those things. We go through the whole basics of, you know, why is there a drastic rise in disease? You know, 
Is there a role of the microbiome? Of course there is in so many different levels, far more than you would think actually. I was just reading an article a while back on, on certain microbes shifting secretion of bile acids and reabsorption of bile acids is fascinating. So then digestion and the GI tract, looking at if you're not breaking your food from large to small, what does that mean for your nutrient content? What does that mean for immune stimulation? We look at SIBO, and honestly, SIBO is not what you think it is. So many people out there saying, take the rifaximin, right? Take your antimicrobial herbs, knock it out. Whoa, I, I found a whole other avenue of SIBO. I, you, you, you have to see this research, it's fascinating. So then healing diets, of course, if you do have some um, issues with digestion and whatnot, we'll look at the different types of diets. I wrote a book on the elimination diet. So so many people in functional medicine are wanting to understand like, what's irritating my client? And if you haven't looked at the foods, boy, you're missing 80% of the equation. And then of course, this is, the, this is the, the elephant in the room now, this detoxification piece, right? To be honest with you, we stretch this out. And to be honest with you, I don't always stick with the 10 sessions. Sometimes I give extra bonuses and extra lectures because there's so much data. There's just so much data right now on how toxins are altering immune cell function, how toxins are the driving factor behind diabetes, obesity, autoimmunity. It's fascinating research. So we dive into that quite a bit. We also, along the way, we'll look at, we'll look at this tonight as well, mitochondrial and energy production. So the secret behind optimal health is making sure that you're not inhibiting mitochondrial function, and yet you are supporting it. And there are different ways in doing that. And then of course, sleep and mood disorders, we get to the root of these things, and then putting it all together. We have cases throughout this entire course that, that make this practical for you. You know I mean? I'm, I'm talking words right now, but when you, you visualize a person and you see them going through, through hazards in life and then overcoming them, it's fantastic, it's freedom, it's, it's where it's all at. And then I add this uh, additional course on Alzheimer's disease. So if this is something that interests you after this discussion, check it out. We have this half off uh, special right now, 50% off uh, special for the next uh, few hours here. So 12 hours, jump in. It's uh, half, off, half off. All right, let's dive in. Let's, let's look at some of the, the things that uh, we all need to know about something that's incredibly important, which is uh, vitamin D. So vitamin D, as you know, uh, from this incredible review article in 2007 by Dr. Michael Hollick, is paramount for turning off excessive inflammatory response. We know it's paramount for bone health. We've done that for, for decades. But now we're seeing when it comes to cancer, when it comes to musculoskeletal pain, when it comes to neurological conditions, there's a turnoff switch. And vitamin D does this. So in my program, I share Colleen Hayes' research on this. She shows how this happens. It's pretty fascinating. And if you don't have adequate vitamin D, then you are more prone for inflammatory disorders. That means everything. Basically, that means most chronic diseases known to man. So it's extremely important that we look at vitamin D levels, of course. The fascinating thing started happening for me, um, you know, I started researching this in 2004. So about 10 years ago, it was 2007, I started seeing non-responders. I started seeing people who you'd give them lots of vitamin D and they wouldn't respond. We'd say, oh, you know, this is a digestive disorder. We diagnose celiac uh, through their GI doc. And sure enough, they'd start getting vitamin D in. But then there'd be other ones, with no GI disorder, plenty of sun. What's going on? How come it's not budging? Look at the genetics. That's not vitamin D binding protein. What is going on? So I'm one of those guys who's like, oh, come on, I got to find out the answer, right? I got to know the mechanism. What is happening here? So I jump in I start looking through all the data. And sure enough, you see some nuances. But it wasn't until I went to a conference in 2009 and I hung out with Dr. Michael Hawk, the author of that New England Journal of Medicine paper. And we took a cab back to the hotel from the conference together. And his hotel room was right next to mine, and we were talking for a little bit. And I was just like, you know, Dr. Hollick, this is absolutely fascinating. But what are some of the things that I wouldn't learn from your papers? And he says, well, if you look closely, Tom, there's something up and coming that you should really pay attention to. It's called Pixar. I was like, what? Pixar? What, what's that? He says, it's the pregnane X receptor. And we've seen children who have been on valproic acid, anti-seizure medications, whatnot, that their vitamin D levels will go way down. So they have a vitamin D insufficiency. So I thought, oh, well, all right. 
sure, I see clients and autistic kids. I was part of the Autism Research Institute Scientific Roundtable. Sure, I see the autistic kids on seizure meds, but and adults too. But what else is there? If this is Pixar, like what else is going to excite Pixar? So um, first, I let's show you what this is. Pixar is basically a receptor. This is something in your DNA that gets bound by certain substances and it promotes then the production of certain proteins. Let's back that out a little bit. Okay. So when you eat food, when you inhale substances, they often will signal your genes to behave a particular way. When you have certain chemicals, they bind to this Pixar, this receptor, and they tell your genes to produce a specific protein called cytochrome P450-24, CYP24. Now, everybody knows these as detox enzymes, but the CYP family is actually a nuance. I explain this. It's not, it's not really detox. It's, a, it's part of your immune system. And it, it approaches hormones and it approaches vitamin D and it approaches so many different things. So please don't think this is just detox, okay? This is a, a biotransformation enzyme, all right? So what am I saying? I'm saying if you were to have certain substances, you can see your DNA right here. These substances will bind to this Pixar. They will cause the DNA to open up in certain regions, read certain proteins, and they produce this 24 hydroxylase protein. It's also called an enzyme, right? And when you make this particular protein, you will start putting a hydroxyl group on the 24th carbon of vitamin D. So normally we're looking for the circulating 25 hydroxylase, the 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol, right? This makes something totally different. You start ramping up this enzyme, you have a lot of this protein around, you start making 24 25 hydroxy vitamin D or 124 25 di or trihydroxy vitamin D in this case. What does that mean? That means you make substances that don't work. You make substances that get broken down really quickly in the human body. What this means is you deplete your vitamin D stores. So while this has all been, you know, talked about for a long time based on medication, what I've been diving into is what environmental constituents also do this. So we're not all taking anti-seizure medications but we are all exposed to pesticides. And if you look closely in the literature as I've done, you'll see that there are over 200 different pesticides that have been tested to activate, readily activate this Pixar. 106 activate the human Pixar and only 93 activate mouse Pixar. Now, why is this significant? Because there's no one talking about this. That's why. Because everybody looks at mouse research and says, you know what, mm, some of these things we're looking at, maybe they're, they don't apply because they're not affecting a mouse. I wanna demonstrate something here. Humans are not mice. You can give all sorts of different types. We were just at a, a brain conference and <laughs> Dr. Bredesen, right, the specialist in Alzheimer's, he says, we don't suffer from Alzheimer's. We suffer from Alzheimer's because all the research is on, on mice, right? And it, does not correlate across the humans. So a lot of pesticide data, a lot of toxicity data, you'll see is done in a murine model, a, a mouse, a rat model, right? And the reality is it doesn't cross over very well. So there are more pesticides that seem to harm humans than there are that harm mice. And if you want a level of, uh, of identification, you can actually pull up this Environmental Health Perspectives article in 2010, and it shows which particular compounds activate Pixar better than others. So if indeed some of the compounds like that we'll see in that, that chart that activate this Pixar, do they in fact then cause deficiency in the United States population? Because it's one thing to say, you know, this is here. Another thing to say is this is actually happening, right? And it turns out that sure, organochlorine pesticides actually do activate Pixar quite nicely. And it turns out there is an association between organochlorine pesticides and vitamin D deficiency in the United States population. So in essence, it's possible 
that if you have a client or you have a relative or you yourself live next to, next to an agricultural area where they use organocloning pesticides that have a very long half-life, that you could be degrading your D because of your pesticide levels. You may need to actively take place in detoxification to optimize your vitamin D levels. It doesn't stop there. It turns out that when you're hanging out going to the grocery store and you're grabbing a receipt, or when you are <laughs> eating food wrapped in saran wrap, that you could be actually degrading D as well. So if you look closely, <laughs> BPA, right, the plasticizing agent, it's used to soften up the PVC plastics, right? That substance, while it has a very short half-life in the human body, when it is in the human body, can activate this Pixar quite strongly. It's a very potent agonist of the actual Pixar. So, oh my gosh, what's the problem then? Well, the problem is, all throughout the daytime, when you're eating processed foods wrapped in plastics, or you're eating canned foods, or you're, you're grabbing under receipts, you could be diminishing the actual level of vitamin D in your body. Now, here's another thing to show you that BPA and humans act differently than rats and humans. Look at this. The human receptor is affected. The mouse receptor is not. So it's fascinating to me. We're doing all this research on the safety of BPA, and we're saying, yes, no problem. These rats have this LD50, this lethal dose 50 uh, uh, you know, reaction, toxicity reaction. It's totally safe. Got the levels that you're finding in humans. No, 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 no big deal, right? And yet there's this massive pathway here that may be contributing to cardiovascular disease in humans that's not being researched because we think the rats are safe, therefore humans are safe. So once again, we, we get into this uh, in, in a program, but when it comes to cardiovascular disease, it is not what you think it is. It is by no means elevated cholesterol. There are so many other factors that contribute to cardiovascular disease, it's not even funny. If you haven't read the blog post on vitamin K yet, uh, I highly recommend it. I uh, just put that out on the, the website uh, last week, and it's already gotten over a 1,000 shares, quite a few, 10,000 plus views and whatnot. And people seem to really grasp the importance of balance of calcium, vitamin D, and now vitamin K2. Well, you need to start grasping that BPA alters vitamin D. And you need to start grasping that BPA is actually an independent contributor to cardiovascular disease risk. So I'll be sharing some more blogs, and I share a ton in my PPCP program, but keep this one on your radar. It's incredibly important. So here's the actual blog post. If you haven't read this one yet, I would suggest you run, not walk, and check it out. Um, there are so many of my clients who are coming in to see me, and their most common supplement is calcium. Secondary to that is either magnesium or vitamin D. And unfortunately, when they're taking a high level of calcium and a high level of vitamin D, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, over 5,000 I use especially, and then 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium, there may be an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and heart attack. That calcium that gets pulled into the body has to be deposited into the bone, has to be pulled out of soft tissue. If there is a vitamin K2 insufficiency, we know that the calcium is not carried around where it needs to go. That's what this whole article is about. We know that vitamin K2 donates two electrons to a pathway along with a reducing substance called NADH plus H. And in that process, it allows for glutamic acid to change shape, bind onto calcium, and put it where it needs to go. So this whole thing is called a carboxylation reaction. And you can totally shut down this reaction by adding in a single chemical. And that single chemical is called warfarin or coumadin. So you will no longer carboxylate clotting factors to cause a risk of you know, some sort of clot forming and then causing cerebrovascular cardiovascular disease. However, <laughs> You also increase the risk for calcium being deposited in the vessels. 
There are two primary proteins I talk about in this article, osteocalcin and matrix glaw protein. One of them puts calcium in the bone, needs K2. The other one pulls calcium out of soft tissue. And literally, there's research right now. They're doing these large trials, 380 micrograms MK7 K2 to reverse calcification in arteries. Reverse calcification. Okay, so this is an incredibly important pathway. And yet, if you add in something that blocks these reducing pathways called warfarin, you end up with more calcification. Sure, you have less clotting, but you end up with stenosis. So you're closing the actual vessel off. And look closely at the research. I'm not seeing longevity with the use of warfarin. I'm not seeing an improved quality of life because people who don't die of clots have an increased risk of aortic calcification and may die of that. Okay, so that's a different story. But I want you to think about something for a second. How is this all occurring? How is vitamin K2 able to be used? It's able to be used because it's being reduced. This whole process is allowing for reducing of something. What does that mean? Well, I have an entire module on mitochondrial function where I talk about how electrons pass back and forth and you have a free radical and you have an antioxidant. One donates, one takes away, right? So in this particular case, this is donating. And if you're donating, that means in essence, you're an antioxidant. Which means what? Which means if you have an environment of incredible chemical toxicity, if you have somebody who has elevated heavy metals, elevated pesticides, they might actually not have the capacity to make vitamin K in a form that's active. How do we know this? Well, if you look at the research closely, you'll see that the key ingredient for this reaction at the bottom is something called NADH. And you'll see that this is produced primarily through the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria of cells. Okay, what does that mean? That means we take fats and we take carbohydrates and we take proteins and we turn this cycle around and we pitch out this NADH. So NADH comes from the mitochondria working well. Without the mitochondria working well, without these intermediates functioning quite well and everything going along according to plan, then you don't have enough substrate, you don't have enough ingredients to allow for vitamin K to be in the form that it needs to be in. Now, what would affect the mitochondria? Well, if you look at Environmental Health Perspectives 2010, you can see, look at this. It's been examined since 1962 that mitochondrial function is a cause of disease. And now the field of mitochondrial toxicology is getting a fresh boost with the realization that environmental agents may play a significant role in many mitochondrial diseases. If there is an error in any of the myriad steps involved in energy production, organ and system function can falter. Okay, we now know Alzheimer's, autism, cancer, cardiovascular disease, Parkinson, these are all suspected to be involved with mitochondrial dysfunction. All right, what's the primary target of most chemicals studied? It's the mitochondria. You know, I was sitting at this conference, the EHS, Environmental Health Symposium Conference. I was lecturing there, and I was having uh, a late-night uh, discussion with Dr. Walter Crinian, one of the, the United States experts on detoxification. And in fact, he's writing a textbook right now. It'll be out in March of 2018 with Joe Pizzorno. It's absolutely fantastic what research they're looking at. And Walter says to me, he says, you know, Tom, out of the 87,000-plus chemicals in use today, it doesn't matter which one I examine. It doesn't matter which one I look at. I can always, always find a way in which they inhibit mitochondrial function. They interfere somewhere along the electron transport chain, somewhere along the enzymes of the Krebs cycle. They, they interfere somewhere and they cause an imbalance of mitochondrial function. 
So this is a really great review, Toxicological Sciences in 2013. Mitochondria as a target of environmental toxicants. You don't have to look very far. And you'll see there are so many different ways that things like heavy metals can come in. There are so many things that can inhibit different parts of this mitochondrial process. They can embed themselves in the mitochondrial phospholipid membrane that's just rich in fats. So you'll have the plastics, for example, or PCBs, for example, that can lodge themselves in there. DDT is a great example for this. And it will inhibit the mitochondria from functioning very well. If the mitochondria does not function very well, it spins off free radicals, it doesn't produce enough of the NADH, and you may have a lack of ingredients to preserve K2. Now, the cool thing is, is that you can do the exact opposite. You can actually pull in substances that ramp up NADH production. So this is research coming out of uh, the sirtuins, right? We're looking at the sirtuin uh, activating compounds like resveratrol, for example. And there's something on the marketplace now, and we have a, a, a piece dedicated to this called nicotinamide riboside. And it turns out that this nicotinamide riboside might ramp up the body's production of mitochondria themselves. So if you eat certain foods, you might be able to actually tell your cells, just like you told them, hey, let's produce more of that 24 hydroxylase. You can actually tell your cells, hey, let's make more mitochondria. Certain things like tryptophan, nicotinamide, uh, nicotinic acid may actually allow for more NADH, and then certain foods might make more gene expression compounds that make more mitochondria. So there's a way out of everything. For the yin, there is the yang, right? There's the up, there's the down. We can actually reverse this thing. Well, what is this going to look like in a particular person? Well, I use this case in my blog post, right? There's a video, a YouTube video. Check it out. 70-year-old um, female, right? She comes in. She has calcification of the tendons and joint pain. She has IBS at the age of 32 diagnosed, which is telling me she's probably not absorbing nutrients very well. She probably has a permeable gut. This might be leading to inflammatory issues. It might be leading to problems there. She ends up being diagnosed with aortic stenosis at 49. Plaques closing off the aorta. Recurrent calcification of the joints, same time, age 49. She can actually palpate this calcium deposition that's happening in her knuckles, right? She has osteoarthritis at age 52. Look at the research on that. What is osteoarthritis? Inflammation, right? But it's also calcium deposition in the bones in the wrong place. Okay, so she has some sort of calcium imbalance, and she has decreased bone density. So saying calcium's not staying in the bone. Calcium's going into soft tissue. So these signs are all pointing to a vitamin K insufficiency. So we looked at something called a vitamin K assay, and we said, aha, is there a possibility that she has indicators there's not enough vitamin K in her system? And sure enough, yes, there were. But what else did I look at? I looked at toxicity. And when you start examining your clients who have vitamin K insufficiency, who have vitamin D insufficiency, and whether you're running something like the NutriVal, which I ran here and we showed some mercury elevation, or you're running, running some sort of toxicological test from uh, Great Plains or Genova itself, you might find, like I am, that there's a drastic increase, a rise in chemical exposure associated with these deficiencies. So my message to you is look outside the box. If you're seeing some random diseases these days and you have no idea how to get them better, where to, to, to turn, what kind of lab analysis to do, I'm going to say, look at the toxins. This is the pink elephant standing smack dab in the middle of the room that everybody seems to be ignoring. And unfortunately, you have to dive deep into the nuances of research to prove that these things are connected to what we're seeing today. But I've done that. Joe Pizzorno has done that. Walter Crinian has done that. And what you're going to see in the next six months to 12 months, 
This is going to be front and center. This is going to be the next wave of functional medicine. So I have an entire module in this course dedicated to something called toxicant-induced loss of tolerance. We look at how your environmental surveillance system, the cells that we call immune cells, are being altered by their interactions with air pollution. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have data proving that air pollution is actually a more significant factor to cardiovascular disease than cholesterol. Okay, so you've got air particles that are coming in. You've got water pollutants. Did you know there's acetaminophen, there's caffeine, there are pesticides in everybody's drinking water. There's a, an elevated level of arsenic and lead in different parts of the United States. Flint, Michigan is just a drop in the bucket, right? So if you're not paying attention to what's happening, you're going to be confused. You're going to say, why isn't this autoimmune paleo protocol working? Why am I going on a ketogenic diet and some of my symptomology is actually getting worse? So I invite you, jump in, check it all out. Let me be your guide. Let's go through this together. All right, so gang, tell me, do you guys have questions? Let me know what you want to know about and we'll chat. I know somebody emailed me and they said, hey, what's the, the best level of vitamin K? And um, I would say, well, it depends on the form. But let's talk about uh, some of these questions. All right, great, okay, good. Well, let's, let's do the K one first. Um, vitamin K, there are a couple of different forms of vitamin K. One is going to be the MK4, and one is gonna be the MK7. This is the K2, right? So you have K1, which is used for clotting, and K2, which is used for calcium homeostasis. And if you want calcium going into the bones and staying out of the vessels, then the form of K2 that you're going to look at is probably going to be MK7. Now, there are two primary fours, MK4 and MK7. MK4 is a longer, uh, excuse me, a shorter um, substance and stays in the system for like an hour or two, if you're lucky, as a half-life. So you need to take it throughout the day. The research shows that the dosing is at 15 milligrams three times per day. That can get expensive. So if you're wanting to maintain your K levels, you might want to try MK7. And MK7 can be done in microgram doses, anywhere between 180, 360 micrograms per day. And you only need to take one dose uh, every uh, uh, once a day or once every other day if you want to take a higher dose. Which type of K is in leafy greens? Great. So that's the phylloquinone, and the phylloquinone is actually an MK1. And it's interesting because a lot of people say, well, if I have enough MK1, I should be getting enough MK2. And that used to be the case, but um, I don't seem to see that as now. Uh, in fact, if you look at the literature, the conversion rate of MK1, or excuse me, not MK, K1 to MK4, which is the form that K1 gets converted to, is very, very low you would need to have a tremendous amount of uh, K1 and optimal conversion. And usually in today's day and age, I don't see that's adequate. And because of the toxicity exposure that we're all dealing with these days too, I don't see that the uh, normal dietary levels are sufficient unless you're eating goose liver for MK4 or you're eating natto. And natto is this fermented soybean paste that has a tremendous amount. It's over a thousand uh, micrograms of MK7 per serve, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a very pleasant <laughs> texture or taste, so not everybody enjoys that. Um, so yes, I would say uh, see if you can get your K2 from goose liver or uh, from uh, natto or take some supplements. And most people enjoy taking the supplements actually because it's a lot uh, more palatable. Can you take too much K2 or will your body just excrete the excess? You know, there are no upper limits for K2 at this stage. Um, in fact, there's not really an upper limit for K1. People are concerned about over clotting with K1 and it doesn't seem to happen. In fact, it was a very large trial over four years, people taking five milligrams of, MK, or of K1 and not having any issues. And then there's been very large trials with uh, well over 45 milligrams per day for multiple years with no adverse effects as well. 
Uh, I'd love to know how you supplement nicotinamide riboside. How much would you recommend that on a daily basis and for whom? Oh, that's great. Well, it's a relatively new product, and it's that 250 milligram supplement uh, called Niacel from Thorn Research that I've been using. And usually I'll just do the one cap twice a day, and it doesn't seem to replace niacinamide, which is interesting. Um, specifically for the reactions of um, the tryptophan pathway. So let me break this down for you. I'll, I'll do a little instruction. Or, I, I'm sorry if this is complex for some people, but tryptophan is the least common amino acid in the human body. You get about 1.5 grams in a day if you're lucky. If your digestion is awesome and you're eating tryptophan-rich foods, you know, meat sources are usually high in tryptophan, some of the, the nuts and seeds, but mostly the meats, right? So you're eating the tryptophan, hopefully you're breaking it down, your stomach acid, you're utilizing, you know, all your, your digestive enzymes effectively, you get it in. Once you get it in, it competes with multiple other, other amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, valine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, to get in through the brain and allow for you to form neurotransmitters. So it's, it's this uphill battle, right, to get adequate uh, tryptophan into your system. Well, you know what the worst thing is? The worst thing is if you have an inadequacy of niacin because it takes 60 tryptophans to make one niacin. You'll actually rob your tryptophan to make niacin. So this is why Linus Pauling, Abram Hoffer in the 1950s wrote this incredible book called Orthomolecular Psychiatry. And in it, they use niacin treatment as a central treatment for a lot of neurological disorders. Quite, quite fascinating information. But the nicotinamide riboside, it's just the one cap twice a day with that. There's also something called resveracel, which I've been using, which combines the resveratrol and some flavonoid compounds along with the nicotinamide riboside. So not only do you get more of the NADH uh, production, but you also get more mitochondria proliferation because those are the uh, things that make the body make more mitochondria, which is fascinating. Um, do you recommend it on a daily basis and for whom? Um, yes, for people who have energy insufficiency issues, a lot of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia people benefit from that. Oh my gosh, did you see Bob Navial's new article on that? Anyway, um, I mentioned that. In your program, do we receive recordings of each session that we can review afterwards, or what if we miss a lesson? Yes, are you kidding me? Come on, you see how I fly through topics, right? Um, I get really excited about things, and I want you to know the research links. I want you to listen to my interviews that I've done with microbiologists, immunotoxicologists. So I give you those links, um, and I also give you the video recordings and the audio recordings within 24 hours of the session. So you'll jump in on those and you'll say, whoa, you know, I got to listen to this in my, my headphones. I got to regurgitate that. And I'll be honest with you, there are doctors, there are trained MDs who are, there's a guy who's starting my course again for the fourth time tonight, the fourth time. So I'm like, what? You know, this is so cool. It's so flattering. I got another person who's in for the third time, another person who's in for the second. So um, yes, there's a lot of data. I would never expect you to get it on first pass. That's not how I roll. I'm here to serve you. I want you to gain the information. I want you to know the understanding, and I want you to not only apply it, but I want you to teach it. I need you. I need you to teach this stuff because I'll tell you what, if you're not looking at air quality and you're not looking at chemical exposures, you're not going to find your clients getting better. It's, it's unfortunate, but in the year 2017, you have to include this stuff. So I want your clients getting better. I'm kind of selfish. Because um, part of this means that everybody needs to be stewards of our air, food, water, and soil. And I love my kids. And I really want them to have proper brain health. I don't know if you've been looking at the data, but you know, pollution now and pesticide exposure lowers kids' IQ by seven points. So I don't want that. I want us all to kind of you know, work together and push through to make the individual feel better. And then once they're better, they can be conscious of what they're doing. They're going to want more organic foods. I'll give you a handout on how to convince them to eat organic foods. You definitely, definitely. I need your help. Do I have a podcast? No, not yet. What's the link to the course? I assume we get that too. Sure, I'll send that to you. Yeah. Is, uh, uh, do you want me to do a podcast? I have a, a URL called Functional Nutrition Radio. Wouldn't that be fun to do like little 15, 18 minute clips every day and just like educate people on little, little tidbits? Uh, if you want that, 
and just say, yeah, let's make it happen. Is Thorn D3 and, and K supplement cover the recommended dose? No. Thank you for asking that. Um, the DK combination supplement is MK4, and it's MK4 at one milligram per thousand milligrams of, of uh, it might be 5,000 milligrams, or 5,000 I use of vitamin D. So that's a really low dose. MK4 is usually used in 15 milligram doses three times a day. So that's a background dose to kind of protect you, but it's not a therapeutic dose if you have low bone density, cardiovascular disease, or stroke risk, not at all. You would need a separate MK4 supplement, which is far more expensive, or you can take something called 3K Complete. And that 3K Complete contains MK4, K1, and the MK7. So that seems to work well. What about the deficiency of boron? Because boron is required for vitamin D metabolism and boron clears chlorine and fluoride out of the body. Boron is upstream from some of the problems you're highlighting. Yes, it is. And in fact, you know who's done a really great job of highlighting boron need? is uh, my friend's uh, mother, Dr. Uh, well, she's not a doctor, yeah, she is, Lara Pizzorno, so doc, uh, Dr. Joe Pizzorno's wife. Um, she's published some great articles on boron. Thank you so much for bringing up uh, the boron aspect. Um, now, if I were to prioritize and look at the research, it's based off research because, you know, the boron awareness and consciousness is just building right now. If we were to just look at D, just look at K, and boron, um, you know, uh, tertiary, you would see that just by shifting DNK, you can make massive shifts with or without boron. Boron may add to that equation, but according to the data, it doesn't seem to be a paramount piece at this stage. Now, you and I both know it's something you want to include, so definitely consider that. All right, looking forward to listening again. Great, nice to have you here, Evelyn. Do chicken livers work or must it be goose liver? Yes. Chicken livers can work. The more pastured the chicken, the better, um, absolutely. But you can uh, get some from chicken livers. There's a chart in my uh, presentation on, on vitamin K in that blog post, so I would hope you would check out that chart. Who makes the 3K complete? Yeah, that's a, oh my gosh, Pam, nice to see you. Um, that's a, uh, a thorn product, yeah, 3K complete. All right. Um, Yes, you will receive recordings. Yes, uh, great. Okay, good. Yeah, awesome. So, um, in essence, we're just scratching the surface here. There are a ton more nutrients that are depleted by medications and toxicants in the environment. This is by no means the sine qua non. This is, this is just the tip. Because really, you name it. Someone name a supplement, and I could probably tell you uh, something that's going to um, have a problem with it. But the, the reality is a lot of B vitamins, I'll show you the research on this, a lot of the things that we think are just a nutrient for a cofactor are in fact antioxidants that cannot become nutrients for cofactors unless they're in the right form. So unless we're paying attention to toxins, unless we're detoxifying, then we may not get what we want. I'll give you one example, B12, methylcobalamin. Methylcobalamin is an antioxidant. So, so many people are using these drastic doses, right? You have to get five of the milligrams when it's normally in a microgram dose you know, of B12 because the vast majority of that is sucked up as an antioxidant in the brain before it actually gets utilized as a cofactor. So this is why some people are finding that the nebulized substances, when it comes to glutathione or N-acetylcysteine, work so much better because you know whoop, it's right to that brain area that gets absorbed almost immediately. It doesn't have to pass through and get a, a lot of contact with potential substances that can change its shape. So what you're gonna learn in this program is form equals function. If something isn't in the right shape, it can't do its job. This is why biochemistry is so important. I have two degrees in nutritional sciences for a reason. I had to know why. I couldn't just say, oh yeah, do this. So I was like, well, why? I'm that kid, right? I'm like my sons. Well, why, dad? Why, you know? Well, you have to see it. I mean, magnesium, do you know why magnesium does what it does? God, if you saw how it docked into an enzyme and then changed the enzyme shape, you would know why it does what it does. So, you know, look at this blog post on vitamin K. I show you why 
the actual vitamin K can't do its job unless it's got that antioxidant portion to it, unless it's got you know this K2 structure that allows for a carboxyl group to grab onto calcium. Form equals function. Break it down even more. Information. The form of something allows for it to mate with other substances. If it's not in the right form, it cannot mate. If it cannot mate, it cannot create a reaction that then changes the shape of the other substance, which then that can go over and mate with something else and change its shape. See how that works? Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. I'll show you diagrams. Would you mind restating information about MK4 or MK7? Which is better for joint pain? Oh, thank you for that. So MK4 and uh, MK4 and MK7 both work for allowing the calcium to come out of the system and get deposited in the bone. There's more data on bone density issues with MK4, but once again, the MK4 is just kind of the older product that's been around a while. It's more expensive, has to be taken in high doses three times a day. So most of the data is over in Asia is done on 15 milligrams of MK4 three times a day. Newer data that's about to come out here in October 2017, nice big trial on MK7, is looking at MK7 at about 350, 380 micrograms per day. Okay, So you can do one or the other, or you can do a combination, which I do, and, and I do the 3K complete, which is five milligrams of MK4. I'll be using one milligram of K1 and then 90 micrograms of MK7. So the combination of formula kind of covers your bases. Now, because you need the MK4 multiple times per day, I'd recommend taking one cap in the morning, one cap in the evening. Okay, cool. What does it take to be able to repeat the course? I am currently finishing the current course. It is better to absorb some and take it the next time around. Oh, shoot me a personal message. I know you, Renata. Um, yeah, and we'll talk about retaking the course. Yeah. Um, is it better to, well, here's the problem about <laughs> me. You know me, Renata. Come on. I'm buried in the research all the time. I'm going to conferences, you know, as being a faculty member for the Institute for Functional Medicine. I mean, every time I go to teach at the AMF MCP, I'll, I'll, I, I teach detox, by the way, I'll sit down and I'll watch the other practitioners and I'll suck up all the information. And lately I've been learning a ton about Alzheimer's and MS and Parkinson's and functional neurology. Uh, Dr. Karazian had some amazing conversations with him. He runs a great neurology course, so I'm going to start studying more neurology. And um, what I know today will change tomorrow. So when you take this course, um, you will see new things. For example, um, I've been doing a bunch of research on these probiotics changing digestive function. Um, and I've also been looking at how calcium alters inflammation. So if you ever have a person who has a brain injury and you give them supplemental calcium and they don't have their K2 imbalance, you can actually throw off the entire microglia repair process in the brain with too much calcium. So it'll change, Renata. <laughs> That's all I can say. It's going to change. It's growing, it's shifting, it's changing. Bunch of new medication data has come out on, on statins, on proton pump inhibitors, on metformin, on all these things that so many people are taking and are not conscious of the fact that metformin depletes B12 or the proton pump inhibitors may contribute to kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. And there's so many different things that as they come out, I'll share those as well. So you'll see the format is shifting. Great. And... What you learned about Alzheimer's and what I now know about Alzheimer's is two different things. So your bonus program, your bonus session is, uh, is totally different as well. Great question. All right. Let's go to chat here. Oops. Oh, I just closed it out. Let's see if I'm missing anything. Could you please say why sublingual um, D3 taken without K2 could be hazardous. Sorry if I missed it. Oh, sure. No, not at all. So this is that blog post. So check it out on our website, wholelifenutrition.net. And sublingual D3 without K2. Um, let's break it down. I learned this from Michael Hollick and Robert Haney uh, back in, in 2007 and 2009. I went and learned from the master. 
And here's what they said. They said, look, Tom, um, when you're taking vitamin D, what you do is you change gene expression, right? So one form meets with another form, changes its shape and behavior, which it allows it to then go and mate with other things. So vitamin D comes into the system and it binds to the DNA in the enterocyte. There are, are vitamin D response elements on your DNA and they respond to vitamin D. And so you have the vitamin D come in. I, I show all this in the vitamin D session. They, they bind on to this DNA and they allow that DNA to start reading proteins. And one of the proteins that DNA reads is called calbindin. It binds calcium and pulls it in. When you start supplementing with D, you actually make more of this calbindin and this more calbindin will then allow for more calcium. If you have inadequate vitamin D, you have about 10, maybe 15% of calcium that can be absorbed. If you have adequate vitamin D, it goes from 30 to 40% for the average person, up to 80% for people who are pregnant or lactating. Okay, so that's a lot of calcium coming in. That's a ton. So of course, the body being infinitely wise says, well, pfft, if we're gonna have all that calcium coming in, I better make more proteins to put in the bone. So it starts making this osteocalcin protein, right? Osteo, bone, cal, calcium, in. Put the calcium in the bone protein. And when it makes this osteocalcin protein, interestingly enough, that is K2 dependent. So the minute you start ramping up the osteocalcin, you start ramping up the need for vitamin K2 in its reduced form. So when you exhaust that K2 by having more osteocalcin, then that K2 that's needed for other proteins, something called matrix GLA protein, disappears. Now matrix GLA protein is fascinating. It is the sweeper calcium protein because it gets carboxylated by K2, hopefully, if there's enough K2 around, it will go and it will bind to, it has a nice little carboxyl group, double negative, that binds to the positives in calcium and pulls it out of plaque, pulls it out of vessels. I mean, you, you see valvular calcification, aortic calcification, carotid calcification. You see all these calcifications that can occur when you don't have enough matrix GLA protein that's what's called carboxylated. So there are actually tests to look for these things called undercarboxylated matrix GLA protein. It's not ready for prime time yet. It's in the laboratory setting now, but there's direct correlations between adequate K2 and this particular protein being carboxylated and calcification. So in essence, when you're taking D, you have more calcium in the body. If you have adequate K, that calcium will go to bone, stay out of soft tissue. If you don't have adequate K, you're increasing that D will diminish K further and leave you at risk for soft tissue calcification. So that's what my blog post is about. Hopefully you can, can gather it all from that. But by the way, sublingual D3, I haven't seen a lot of data on that, have you? Because it's interesting, everybody has these incredible carrier systems and nanotechnology, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, why? Like you can take a crystalline powder D and the research clearly shows the average person for a much lower cost gets plenty of D in their system. Sublingual D? Um, I would, I would look at the papers go. So go look at the papers from that particular company. And if a company cannot provide papers for their specific form and delivery system, then I'm not sure I would trust them. Who makes three K complete? Yes. Just search it. Couldn't find it. Okay. That was thorn research and you have to put three dash K complete. If you go into thorn and you push thorn.com and you put, three dash K complete, you'll see it. Unfortunately, the search bars of, you know, some of the distributors and some of the websites, they're very specific to different figures. So if you don't have that little dash in there, you, you won't find it. How do vitamin D related mutations cloud this picture? Ah, mutations always cloud, but environment always trumps genetics. So whether this is a, you know, uh, inhibition via cytochrome P450 activation or whatever it is, um, oftentimes, or it's digestive complications or inability to uh, get enough sun exposure, I'm, I'm looking there first. Then, of course, you can go down the vitamin D uh, actual 1-hydroxylase, uh, 25-hydroxylase, D-binding proteins. You can look at all the different genes if you're interested there as well. 
Um, does this paradigm work if you have infectious agents binding to your vitamin D receptors? Wow, yeah. Um, it can work. Now, I would want to see that data, Pamela. So if you have that data, which I'm sure you dug into it, you do that quite well. Um, then great, pass it to me. We'll check it out. Um, I haven't dug into that data, so unfortunately, I'm not an expert there yet. Um, share with me, and I will become educated. Is it possible with infectious agents? Sure. Um, oh my gosh, you know, we just looked at uh, all the data coming out about Alzheimer's disease and various different herpes infections and, you know, the EBV and whatnot, and it was fascinating to see um, how amyloid plaques are found in the same places where infectious agent proteins are found. So I was educated by Joe Pizzorno, as you know, um, over the years on detoxification and whatnot. And one of the things he said was, you know, there are in your blood, one of the largest volumes of proteins in your blood beyond your regular albumin is actually proteins from microbes that you've absorbed through your intestinal lining. So you have this permeability and these micro proteins sneak through and they actually get in your blood. So some of those can get through the blood-brain barrier when it's leaky, you're inflamed, you have a leaky gut, and some of those proteins may initiate then some negative reactions in the brain with the microglia there, and you might be actually protecting your brain cells when you form plaques, and that may be why Alzheimer's is initiated in some people. So looking at the infectious agents, looking at, at how we're, we're balanced with the microbes seems to be incredibly, 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 incredibly important. Did you guys see the new New York Times today? It was fascinating. It said, um, pets may be the new probiotics, right? Right? I love that. Meanwhile, I'm leaving my door today to come out here and, and do this webinar and my golden retriever is licking my face and I'm just like, oh, my probiotic buddy. I love you, man. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's never to be underestimated how important uh, the, uh, the micro balances is in the, in the human body. What is the best way to get calcium? I make raw milk kefir, awesome. You know why calcium is in milk, right? Calcium is in milk because it needs to buffer proteins. What do I mean by that? Look at this. When the mom is breastfeeding, right? The mom is breastfeeding to pass on not only the fats to grow the brain and all the amino acids, no. The mom's also passing on immunoglobulins. And the immunoglobulins are quite large proteins. And the first six months of life, the infinitesimal tract is what's called fenestrated. There are little windows. And those windows are there for a specific reason. This is why you don't feed solid foods to kids for the six months of life. Don't. I don't care what your allergist says at four months, you know, and all that nonsense. Look closely. Uh, immunologists and immunotoxicologists and, uh, you know, multiple docs from all over the world are saying they're, they're combating camps. And many are saying, no, don't touch that infant uh, intestinal tract until after that time frame. So that window will close over time, but it's there in the beginning for a specific purpose. You want large proteins to pass on to the infant. If those large proteins pass on to the infant, then the infant can, within a single breastfeeding, shift its immune cell response and combat viruses in the environment, right? Bacterium in the environment. It builds its immune system through mom's breast milk. It needs those large proteins getting in. All right, where's calcium come into this story? It's fascinating. Calcium is a buffer, nature's best buffer. And so it buffers the acid of the infant so those proteins can remain intact. So yes, dairy products are a fabulous source of calcium. However, what you'll see in my food sensitivity elimination diet session is that the vast majority of people walking this planet don't respond well to dairy proteins. Now, if those dairy proteins are broken down effectively in the kefir, it'll be less responsive but that doesn't make you immune. And most people who have been fed formulas early on have their immune system primed to react to those. And look at this. I showed data about how 40% of infants, 40% who are given cow's milk proteins before the age of one have occult intestinal bleeding because their immune system responds negatively to that protein. I show another study of autistic kids Dan Rosignol, colleague from Autism Research Institute, how he showed over 70% of them had antibodies forming to folate receptors 
folate, the thing you need in the brain for keeping calm and happy and everything, folate receptors with cow's milk protein exposure. So kefir, is it a good source of calcium? It depends. <laughs> yes, yes. If I were to burn the kefir in, in a calorimeter and say, oh my gosh, look at this. What's left over is these minerals. I have plenty of calcium. Yes, wonderful source. Now, what else is in the kefir? If you tolerate everything else that's in the kefir, mm, go for it. Beautiful, fabulous source. I make a lanolin-based vitamin D3 now. Oh, you're taking a lanolin-based D3. What source is thornius for D3? Yes, most people are using lanolin. And it's actually, uh, you know, they'll put these UV lamps on the lanolin and uh, form the D3 from that. And it's a vast majority. Freaking brilliant. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, let's see. What does it take to be able to repeat this course? Oh, you did it. Okay, great. Uh, Diane. Hey, Diane, how are you? Hi, Tom. Will there be a recording of this? Sure. I was just able to join. Uh, also, uh, I'm willing to tell everyone how great your program is. I can do this at the end if you want. Well, Diane, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you're liking it, number one. And number two, I'm just honored that you're willing to tell everybody uh, how awesome it is. Um, answer live. How do we do that? Um, I don't know how to turn on your mic. Is that what I would do? Uh, let me see. Participants. And let's see if I can even find you. Oh, let's see. Oh boy, if I pushed unmute all, I think it would be crazy. So yeah, we'll just go ahead and, and um, just go ahead and uh, type something in about what you want me to say for the course. It doesn't look like I can unmute you too well. I, I, you know me and technology. Um, I've got some stuff way down and some stuff, uh, you know, I'm not, not so hot on. So uh, just let me know what I can pass on for you. Oh, Donna, I can tell everyone how fabulous also. Oh, thanks, Donna. Amazing webinar. I really appreciate your work. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Good. Well, what it's sounding like is some people are signing off. It's been about an hour now, so maybe this is our, our, our moment to, to let go and say goodbye to one another. If you enjoy time learning from me, please consider uh, joining the PPCP. I need your help. Uh, there's a lot of messages we spread out. Just last week, I got so pumped up about the air pollution thing. Uh, the whole class, I was, I was just like, oh, look at this, this is fascinating. You know, what are we doing? What is this Paris climate thing? I mean, no one's even thinking about what's actually happening to the air. They're just saying, well, I'm concerned about, you know, global warming and, and climate um, alteration. Well, that's, that's only part of the puzzle. The other part is what happens to the human brain, what happens to the human heart, what happens to the human pancreas when it's exposed to particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons like benzyl apyrene. There's so much data. It's, just, it's all there. It's all showing us that we need to be more conscious. And it's all teaching us as well that the Native Americans always had it right. They said, look, you know, if you're going to look at the almighty dollar as being the end all be all, and you're going to cut off all the trees and you're going to pollute all the rivers, you know, what are you going to eat? What are you going to breathe? What are you going to drink? right? So I'm going to bring that all to you and I want you to spread it out to the world. So if you can join me, fabulous. Sign up now. You get the 50% off. Uh, just go to the wholelifenutrition.net and click on programs, progressive practitioner co program, and then enter for your promo code, make change, all caps, make change together. That's exactly what we're going to do. Oh my gosh. Such an honor to be with you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I will record this. You can pass it on if you need to. Take care in the meantime. All right, bye.